morning. All right. Good morning and glad, welcome to the uh, January 24th uh, press conference. Had a lot going on last week. Obviously, uh, appreciate everybody's patience with the weather on Friday. Fortunately, we were spared the worst, but obviously anything could have happened. I know I worked, uh, walked Friday morning. <laughs> I think it was raining and 34 degrees. Uh, certainly, I felt, uh, I, I, and I could see a few pelts uh, of ice hit as it was sleeting still. Uh, but we were very fortunate it didn't create any any traffic problems here. Uh, but obviously that's the un unexpected. Uh, you just don't know what's going to happen uh, on any of this uh, when these things happen. Uh, it, it's always one of those uh, just things you just got to be prepared. And I think we did the best course of action trying to be prepared for what we knew we could provide safety. I certainly, uh, our, we had a lot of things, sanitation started late. I know several people, myself, didn't get our garbage picked up on Saturday. Thank you, Amy, and, and uh, please tell Fred and everybody out there, thank you uh, for getting out there on Saturday, but uh, we just appreciate your patience working through us, uh, allowing us to get through the weather. Um, I think it was fairly, uh, it could have been significant, and we didn't want anything to happen. So I know, and I know several businesses took late starts uh, to the day, so it did help, and we didn't have any impact. Uh, I will say a couple of the things that happened this weekend, uh, obviously other than just the cold, uh, it was great to have the Chinese, uh, the Japanese New Year, uh, Japan, uh, the, the Japan American Society with UWF. Um, we had the Consul General in town, had the chance to go to dinner with him on the, on Saturday night, and he talked about how this is the only uh, Japan American Society in the state of Florida. He is a Consul General for the state of Florida. Uh, but it was impressive uh, to, to you know hear what they their, in their position on, on Pensacola. We have a sister city Euro over there. We talked about obviously the military presence and the Navy, a variety of things that certainly uh, combine us in a lot of ways uh, with uh, Japan and, and that relationship over there. So we were very happy uh, to welcome him to town, and he had the chance to see what was going on. I think about 600 people attended at SCI. Even though it was a little cool, the, the sun was out. I think they had the drums out there. It was a great event, and I uh, hope if you were one of the 600, I, I, it sounds like you enjoyed your day. Uh, but again, this is just, again, more things that we work with. We certainly appreciate our relationship with the Japan American Society. Uh, so again, uh, certainly from that standpoint. Also last week, um, Circle Gene uh, is a company that is relocated here. I talked about them several times, uh, a desire to find um, biotech here. Uh, interesting company. Uh, they map um, the ability to, uh, to, to look at your um, information from your blood and find out how they can best map. If you have cancer, determine what it is, what it's connected to, and how to best fight it and apply uh, medicine to it so that it can be directly applied to the cancer and not to the rest of the body, I think is where we're beginning to solve ways to solve cancer. It's great to see that Pensacola is gonna be at the forefront of that. Um, Cyclogene had to have a Florida presence. Uh, they were actually looking in Southeast Florida in the Miami uh, Broward County, Miami-Dade and Broward uh, County areas. Uh, we convinced them to come to Northwest Florida. Uh, we thought it was a great thing. We were able to use um, some of the oil spill money from the original 30 million that was set aside, uh, relocate at this point. There are about 10 people here. Uh, they, they plan to grow into 70 as they're moving forward. Uh, they have about uh, they have a significant amount of capital equipment here in what they do um, because it's so unique. Uh, but it's great to see. Um, you know, we've certainly been able to work in in tech and cyber, uh, but it was really good to see the first chance for us to have a biotech. I'm very proud of uh, them being here. Also, a real good friend of mine is a um, I grew up with here in Pensacola is one of uh, the the. Uh, the executive team on that one so uh, I did it was great to it was great to catch up with him and and find an opportunity for him to get back to Pensacola in some ways um, we, we competed hard and we were glad to be able to win that and show what's going on here and I think it's exciting uh, those of you who took the tour I know several people were there for their tour uh, so great to see Commissioner May and um, and also uh, saw Commissioner Bergash, uh, so it was great to have them there. Bruce Woody from ECUA, uh, so it was great to have several people there uh, to take a look and see that company coming in. It just shows what we're continuing to see, more companies, more people 
uh, deciding they want to come to Pensacola and obviously we know that's creating somewhat of a, a challenge on housing uh, but we hope uh, we're going to catch up with that on the supply side but certainly the demand is there people want to come we've been saying that since uh, May people want to come to Pensacola because of the things we've done and so we're very proud of what we've been able to do and, and create a community that people want to be a part of other things that we also have done here the um, city and SYSA uh, they've expanded youth programs uh, through the partnership to expand uh, for Scambia County youth through the new Rafferty Center which will expand the existing May Center already at Legion Field uh, which will provide recreational and educational opportunities to hundreds of our youth uh, certainly it will continue to allow the basketball and football uh, but again, we want to be not just strong bodies, we want to be strong minds, and I think this is going to give us opportunities to do more uh, with, with our children after school and, and continuing to look at ways uh, to in, improve their, their skills as far as uh, their, their reading and writing and science and all the things that we need to be doing. Uh, we want to build uh, strong minds as well. The Rafferty Center will be constructed alongside Legion Field at the Thermopolis May Center uh, and is funded primarily through a million dollar donation from Troy and Ashley Rafferty along with other private donations including uh, monies from the state of Florida. Uh, the city is happy to be a part of uh, a party uh, to this and be a partner and I again we think it will allow us to significantly expand uh, the services that we have on the west side and we're very excited about it and we certainly want to express our appreciation both to SYSA and that partnership but also to the Rafferty's for their donation and many of the other groups as well that have donated. Uh, COVID-19 according to the Florida Department of Health uh, positivity rate was at 35.1 percent um, and the, we continue to track the hospitalizations on the dashboard. Uh, kind of what we're seeing right now is we've generally sort of stalled um, and we've sort of remained flat here for almost a week. We went from 239 on Friday to 226 on Saturday to 246 on Sunday to 247 on Monday. So uh, again, we and we were at 245 I think last Wednesday. So we've kind of for a week we've sort of stabilized and, and matched where we thought we would and begin to see the numbers uh, begin to uh, go down where is what we're hoping. Uh, meeting with the hospitals today at 2 o'clock and look to have more from them once we once we hear we continue to stay on top of seeing where uh, where things are with with COVID and with Omicron. Again the best defense that continues to be discussed uh, certainly against significant impacts is is go ahead and get your vaccine and your booster and we continue to, to uh, look for ways to uh, encourage people to do those. Finally, at, at I-110, uh, the city continues to work with local organizations to connect homeless individuals with shelter. Obviously, at no, no time that we see better than this weekend, uh, the real need to get into shelter, and we are working on that. I think what's lost in that is that we've already connected 75 individuals uh, to shelter and placed them in shelter. I think that's one of the biggest things that we've been able to accomplish over the last year in setting up the encampment and being able to move people into shelter and other resources. Uh, again, we're continuing to work toward the smoothest possible transition, uh, transition for everyone from the I-110 encampment. We're hearing positive things from not-for-profit partners about connecting many of the individuals uh, to shelter and we will continue to do that. We certainly have our REAP um, respite shelter that's looking at probably about 40 individuals. Um, they are expected to be open. We continue to work with them in, in mid-March. Uh, by the 1st of March we do expect to have 25 units uh, available at Bright Bridges and uh, somewhere to flex between 5 to, to 20 at uh, at uh, Dreamhouse. So uh, we continue to work through many of our partners that we funded uh, to find opportunities for people to get shelter uh, and we continue to work through that. We do believe that we will have many of those by the end of February, first of uh, middle of March. In the interim we, we are looking at uh, continuing to find ways to uh, transition people. We have both a sort of a, a private um, that we continue to work with our, our partner organizations uh, that are looking to uh, uh, that are looking to um, help us in this process. They are looking at taking most of the individuals that have signed up and find ways that they can work with and we will continue to work with them to place anyone who is looking for help and says they want to sign up for one of these programs. We will have a spot for them one way or the other. 
Uh, we, we have some of those that are potential to be uh, outdoor and some of them that potentially be indoor. So we continue to work through that. Again, that would probably be a 30 to 45 day program of transition, uh, but we have been busily working with our partner organizations and with, um, with Mr. Powell in the back. So again, we continue to work. I think the collaboration that, is, that we've worked with has been impressive. When you think about already placing 75 people in, in there and looking at about anywhere from another um, uh, 70 to 100 uh, units that we could, or beds that we could create, um, I think it's incredible what we've been able to do and uh, we'll continue to see what we can do. But again, I think the city of Pensacola has only so much that it can absorb, uh, but we've been the ones here working it. We've been the only ones out there doing something and we, commend, we continue to be committed to finding solutions uh, to moving people in there. Unfortunately, as we know, um, at the end of the month, we will be uh, working with uh, DOT to return their, their place to what it, it's supposed to be. We appreciate their patience in working with the city at this time to get us through uh, the end of January. And we, are, uh, we really appreciate the, uh, the, the partnership with many organizations opening doors, pathways for change, um, REAP, um, Dream House, Bright Bridges. Uh, they are placing people and providing programming Lakeview. Uh, so we see a variety of things that are uh, providing services and, and figuring out how to move us into a better situation that we can work with our homeless and give them hope for uh, recovery and respite, uh, both of those things. So again, that's where we stand at this particular time. If you have any further questions, we'll be happy to answer them, but we'll open it up to uh, you, the press, and be happy to answer any of your questions. Jeremy, good to have you back. was uh, I guess sort of where we're going and again we expect all of the units that we have to be up and running by by middle of March um, many of those will come online before the end of February again in a perfect world it would have been great if council had made their decision at the beginning of November that would have given us another month that we probably could have had everybody open at, at the end of at the end of January uh, the question was, you know, where where are we with transition, and where are we with with what's going to happen with the um, with the encampment? Um, obviously, as we've communicated uh, at the end of January, we we're working to clear that space out. We'll close the park at the end of January, and we'll take two weeks to work to clean it. Um, at the time it's cleaned, it'll be back open. Um, um, and again, we hope to have that done. I see. Brian in the back, we hope to have that reopened by the 15th. Um, but again, those are things we need to do and we need to get it cleaned back up to where it was before uh, and what it looked like before we started this process. Um, again, the camp had started, we were approached by um, both um, opening doors and pathways for change about doing something and putting it in there. We worked with Lawrence uh, to begin to put some um, of our uh, of our uh, stuff out there to be able to allow for people to use it. Um, all of those public assets will be moving from there, will be closing the park down. Uh, there is an option we can look if we have to uh, move in, in a certain direction to have a public response, we certainly can. It won't be at that location, uh, but, we'll, but we'll evaluate. For the most part right now, we think we have an opportunity in that transition to be all uh, other places some of which will be inside at, um, at shelters, some which could, be, which could be hotels, and then some of which may be at the respite center uh, with REAP. They have the ability um, to work with a few of the people out, outdoors, and they're working with that right now. My understanding is from Lawrence is that many of those people already signed up and have, have made the choice. I guess I should have showed. Um, <laughs> you haven't seen it. We, uh, and this is fairly small, I know what, uh, uh, but we had a full-size version, uh, sort of what's been handed out. This is the whole. Um, this is the whole thing that shows the survival guide uh, that was handed out to everyone, and we continue to walk through and, and meet with people and, and hand this out. 
We also have essentially right here, which are the organizations which we funded, which are uh, Bright Bridges, Pensacola Dream Center, Canopy of Hope, uh, 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 the REAP, um, and Lakeview Mobile Response Team. Um, so we also have been working to send those out um, to all of those um, all of those individuals to work with them to find a way to get them in shelter. Um, and right now we're working on transition that we do think we have a um, we have a short term shelter uh, that may be able to work um, and that we would pay for the rooms or the other things that we had for the. Uh, Sorry, I've just got a couple questions. You might want to clarify when you say the park will reopen. It's. You're, you're referring to the park, not the encampment. Correct, correct, so you said we'll place correct, for cleaning correct. And then it'll reopen. <laughs> correct. So just to uh, clarify, the camp will not reopen. The park will reopen, um, which is Hollis T. Williams, and it will be by the um, by the guidelines that are going to be a part of the um, it's part of what DOT has indicated. So again, there will be no no encampment there. Um, if we have to look, at, if we have to work with other people, we we always can look at other uh, other potential sites that we have. But at this time, we do think everybody can transition into one of those other things, either hotels, uh, either with REAP uh, being outdoors, or with a, another uh, shelter that we have uh, an ability to work with and, and pay for rooms at that time until we can get uh, until we can get to probably the middle of March. Well, yeah. <laughs> We absolutely do. We we uh, seen Lawrence in the back. We think we have we have a place for everyone. I just want to clarify on that. So are you saying everyone who wants help wants to be relocated to shelter will be able to find the space before thirty first? On, on the thirty first, correct. We will have a place for them to go to on the thirty first. It will not. It may not be the final position that we have because we won't be getting Bright Bridges and some of the other ones open until that time. But, uh, but it will be a temporary place that we can work with them, have them there for, in, for up to 30 to 45 days. Uh, at this point, everyone's telling us they think they can be up and running within the next 30 to 45 days. We've worked with contractors and a variety of people to make sure that, that all these places can get up and running. And again, we're working through it. That's not an option. I mean, the, 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 again, our, our position is we have to find places to put people. We will absolutely find places to put people. Uh, it's not going to be there. And we know, we know that, that that location is going to be, have to be, uh, have to be removed. So again, we will be, we will be removing that. And again, even if the city had to move other people, we have that option. I mean, again, the city has the ability to, to uh, to designate certain areas is what they're doing, and again, that will that that's not going to be at Hollis T. Williams. Yes, Chair. Has the city been approached, you know, by, by anyone regarding the lawsuit? <laughs> I mean, I mean, I mean, you know, um, two two part of the question. One is, it's amazing in this part, Jeremy just what we've told you about, about the collaboration and what we've been able to achieve. Um, you're looking at how working together, we've already placed 75 people in shelter and we have the ability to place probably up to nearly 100 more people in shelter. That's what you do when you work collaboratively. There is no doubt in this process there are a few people who do not understand collaboratively that want to have everything their way. I fully expect that they will sue. We're prepared and we are ready to go. But let me say a couple of things that will happen. Um, much of what is right now in U.S. court precedence is set there, Jeremy, because of, of, of fact cases that have happened before. They are based on the evidence and the factual things that happened before that case was decided. Um, oftentimes, when groups look to sue and, and cities don't get the ch chance to take this in, uh, we have to take probably the worst of what we have. Uh, we've been very diligent and very prepared throughout this process and we've known that, that there's a very likely potential we will be sued. Uh, we have worked very diligently to put a fact case that begins to show a variety of things that asks the court how we can be working and working with other organizations uh, to put forward an idea that, 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 brings, that tries to bring everybody together. 
and again that not everybody gets their way in 100% of what they want um, and what does the court want to do but how also does the court look at questions related to uh, everyone's access I mean going back whether it's the city of Pensacola Charter the 1968 Florida Constitution the US Constitution the Declaration of Independence all the way back to Magna Carta it fairly well establishes that, uh, that, that common property is the same and everybody has the same rights. Um, so, I mean, again, we look, we look forward to answering some of those cases. And again, we don't get to choose which cases go. go. Uh, we just have to be prepared. And, and we think if somebody does take us to court, um, we think it can be monumental for, for cities and counties and how they do it and begin to show a real way this has been much more than just us trying to solve our problem i really think we have the ability to do it now we won't know if we don't get sued we won't get to take this action but uh you know I, I hope some of those things happen and we can really reset court precedent in a variety of ways and begin to uh begin to begin to really offer cities an option um, certainly we talked about Asheville has done much the same thing that we did um, they didn't have a have necessarily a problem um, if somebody chooses to take us to court we think our fact case uh, the things that come come before us and what we show we've been able to do and how we've been able to place people in housing and the product that we do have and the fact that we will have a place for everybody to transition and everybody to go long term into uh, we feel like really puts out there a way that people can work together and we hope uh, you know from from cities and both in Florida League of Cities uh, Florida Association of Counties, uh, NACO, uh, the National League, uh, we hope there'll be an opportunity for us to work together to begin to put forward a good court case that, that really allows uh, communities that work together and find solutions collaboratively uh, to be able to find that. And again, um, we, we look forward to finding a way to overturn um, uh, precedents that has happened. So, you know, I, I think we've put ourselves in a position that we know what we can do uh, we'll see what happens i can't control the other part um but i will say we're very prepared um, charlie pepler is very prepared um, vanessa i mean everything that we've done in this process and how we've done it um you know we've given people an overabundance of notification um we went double the 10 days we were required to do we've done a variety of things uh, everything we've done has been to line ourselves up in the event that we do get to go to court. Um, so, has anybody on the organization, ACLU, etc., actually approached the city? No, no, no one's approached the city. Uh, but we continue to hear rumblings, and I know a few people who probably, who, um, who, who uh, certainly certainly want to do that i mean it's been a part of the process we know from the beginning um so again it's why we've been prepared for it i have no idea but we think there'll be an, an incredible amount to be amicus because of what you're setting the precedent on um i mean I, again if they choose to choose us I think the fact, the, the, the evidentiary facts that we'll be able to bring, the variety of things that we'll be able to put in there, even from public records of, of, uh, of past council meetings, where all the people that have come in and come in to comment, you know, they, they talk about being from somewhere else and coming in here. Um, it's, not, it's not the city of Pensacola's responsibility to take on the homeless problem for the state of Florida or for the nation. Um, and these are all questions that, that do need to be answered, and they're, they're questions that cities are grappling with all over. Um, so I think, I think almost everywhere universally is looking for a new, uh, a new case to set um, and, and begin to establish new precedents of how communities work for to address these ideas. Um, we've tried to put ourselves in there. I mean, again, we established the camp was established by the city and with these other organizations to begin a process. We very much appreciate what, what DOT allowed us uh, to operate. And even if we had to, uh, the law is very broad about allowing us to choose locations within our city that we could do. So, I mean, there are a variety of things that we'll be in compliance with. Uh, what we can't control is whether somebody sues us. And what we hope is that we'll have the ability to set a new case um, that will really allow us cities all over that are, are, are really grappling with this because it is a challenge um, it's unfortunate 
when you have such a, a, a wide net of individuals who are working together uh, to create solutions and find opportunities um, that you have just a couple of people that just seem to want to have it their own way and uh, again that's not what a community is about um, those it's about finding compromise and solutions and collaboration and that's the way we find it I mean we, again I, I look at what we've done as a tremendous success story when you look at we have the ability a small little community like ours has the ability to begin to put people into a variety of um, of, of of, uh, of shelter we put 75 people already in and have another hundred there's nobody else in any, any jurisdictions around us that are doing anything Jeremy uh, you know it, it you know y'all cover all of y'all do all y'all cover multiple jurisdictions I, I ask you please find me another jurisdiction that 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 even is attempting to do this it does anything well with dealing with the homeless what they do what we found is a lot of people bring their homeless to Pensacola, a lot of other jurisdictions. Um, we don't believe that's a very fair way. We'd love to get to the court to begin to, to figure out how we, how we deal with that solution. But I, but I do think that's going to be a big part of it. So if it goes to court, I think we'll be in a very um, good position, um, and we hope to reset uh, the narrative on what's being done and certainly how... Um, the one jurisdiction that actually is 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 putting stuff up and working to find solutions is the one jurisdiction that people continue to, to, to go on. And again, I know there's been a lot of discussion. I've talked to some of you. You've asked me, say, well, do you think these people are the, the county or this or the other county or these other cities should be doing something? I would say, why would they do anything when all that happens is if you do something? The people who are homeless advocates will go after you. If you don't do anything, what do they do? Nothing. There's nothing happening right now to jurisdictions that don't do anything. So, you know, again, this is all part of our, which we kind of hope to expose, um, and we'd love to be able to show, um, show in a national sense what happens. I, I think it's, I think it's ridiculous. Um, you know, the way, the way we, we've uh, we found ourselves. But I think the, the position that Pensacola is in um, has the ability to reset the narrative. And um, if we get that opportunity, we'll be prepared. Yes? Mayor, speaking of resets, could you give us an update on the uh, scooter program after the council meeting last week? Um, well, uh, we've had our first reading. So nothing's going into effect yet until we have second reading. Um, the council was perhaps more lenient on the scooters than I was willing to be. Uh, we proposed what we thought was a, an idea um, of 10 to 10 to 5, um, banning the scooters. Council has come back at the first reading saying five, uh, midnight to 5. Um, the, uh, the, the scooter companies were wanting a certain box and sort of had put that in there. As I expressed, I mean, I, I, I mean, the easier way for us to enforce it if it's citywide, um, so we'd put in there citywide. But if you're going to do a box, it needed to be much bigger than what that box was. Um, that box was a minimum. We know places on the waterfront that are already having problems with people misusing. Uh, that needed to be included. Um, I had real concerns that people could just simply go on the other side of Tarragona and take some of their mischief into, um, into the little square neighborhood, which was not acceptable. So I was glad at least the council didn't just do the box, they, they went ahead and did, they did citywide. Um, the other big takeaway from that is, is you're not going to be able to, um, to, to, to ride the scooters on the sidewalks. It's going to now require to be in the street. I do think um, uh, you all had a chance to see VO when they were here. Uh, I do think that sit down scooter, it's more like a bike, like a traditional scooter. Um, I think it will, it will, the way it will function will be a little bit more used to what people see and drivers and uh, everybody else experiencing with a bicycle. So I think it will go in line uh, a, a little bit. You know, I, I wait to see how that, when that's introduced, how that works. I think it may have an ability to, to breach some of these problems. Um, at this point, we've also outlawed uh, any scooters being placed in certain areas where we know there's not enough sidewalk. We know that on Intendencia. 
Um, we know that in a few other locations uh, that we've, we've indicated, and so we've placed that in there. Um, the, the challenge we've had is um, we were asked by Councilman Wiggins about putting stuff in, and we said we absolutely could, but if we decide to yank the program out at the end of, G of July, at the end of June and in, 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 into July, um, we don't think it's worth us putting a lot of money into that. Now, if we get to the point and the council wants to do something at that point, um, you know, we'll have to look at, at permanent ways to park it more. Uh, but again, for the next probably six months, we'll be looking at some of the parking. But we will, we do plan to enforce, and we do plan to, if we find an area of sidewalk that is being abused and is not wide enough to put that, we'll be happy to to bring those areas into it. I, I told Councilwoman Myers, even though she was for, against all of it, I said, listen, if you tell me certain sidewalks that are in there, we will do it. Our staff already has. Um, again, you, you learn from these things. This is why we put it in as a pilot. We've learned, we've tweaked. It will either work and it will be successful or it won't. Uh, but, I, I, you know, again, um, I've got my feelings. Council has their feelings. Um, they were willing to be much more lenient and open with, uh, with the scooter policy than, than I was. So, Mayor, um, what's your personal assessment as mayor uh, on the future of scooters? Uh, do you think that the people, uh, this is good for the city? I, I, I think there are some places uh, that we deal there's a lot of discussion about cost and poverty. And I think to some extent, um, the scooters and the micromobility offer opportunities that are not there. We see, if you look at the heat map and you see some of the things that are, that are happening outside of the downtown area, the downtown area is where it gets all the stuff. And there's no doubt, there are a variety of people using it downtown and, 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 and that's where we are and we have tourists using it downtown. That's also, those are also some of the good things that we're able to open up uh, our, our, our community a little bit more to our tourists and them not have to get a vehicle. That clearly is, is work, some of the positive. I do think there are also areas where we deal with issues like poverty and other solutions that, that micro mobility does help. There are challenges and like anything, it's just, it's just, I think there's a lot of good that's happening with scooters, but I do think there are people who misuse it and abuse it like anything else. Uh, the question is, did we catch enough of the opportunity to turn off the misuse uh, to see what scooters can be, um, or or will it continue to be? Now, I know there are a number of people who just don't like them, and that's because they're new. I, I kind of discount some of the some of those, but I do listen to the people who have real legitimate issues that come up and experiences negative experiences that come up, and I I understand that. Um, so I, I think. I think part of the fun, but the jury's still kind of out for um, for for it for another six months. Do you think the uh, the current uh, way that the ordinance is going? I know it's a, it hasn't gone to second reading yet. But do you think this addresses the concerns from the downtown improvement board? Well, most everything the downtown improvement board had in there, we've done. Um, uh, again, uh, so I think we've we've worked a lot of the things that they had concerns with the downtown usage. I think I think we were already on. The hours of operation, we were already on taking them off the sidewalks, and I think those were probably the two biggest. There were other minor issues in there. Again, we've outlawed some of the areas of parking. We've we've done some of that, so we'll continue to work. Um, the question I have is, I, I do see I do see families using them, and I assume uh, the, I mean again, we talked about oh, wouldn't it be great to have a trolley service? The problem is trolley service is really expensive. But isn't it great that we have the ferry system and you can get a scooter and your family can go around and see most of the things downtown? Um, and we don't, it's, it's really cheap to us. I mean, that's a very cheap alternative to us as opposed to um, putting together. So, I mean, these are things we've looked at. We've tried to figure out how do we get people to walk and, and, and ride more. Um, I think the scooters and the micro mobility itself allows us to continue that focus on the pedestrian bike safety. Um, downtown and that's what's made us successful and I think we'll continue to see that and uh, again so there, there are very positives there are negatives people misusing and abusing them placing them in the wrong place uh, we're gonna see if we can get past that for for the next six months and and then we'll know where we are at that time you said a couple uh, press conferences ago that once the number of hospitalizations gets above 200 that's when the hospitals start to you know put up a red red flag 
what are, what are, have they been, well, excuse me, what have they been saying as far as like how they're handling this? Um, I mean, now that it's over 200 and you know, that red flag has been waived. You know, we have, um, we've talked about that. I, I think every variant that's come through, they have gotten more experienced at what they're doing and how they're doing it. Um, I, I think to this, uh, for the most part, I see very little concern from them or hear very little concern from them with Omicron, except for a couple of, of factors, the biggest of which I think was happening right when Omicron first started up because it was really their employee base because they had people that were getting sick and having to go home or, or not being able to work and they were coming out of Christmas with a lot of staff still uh, on holiday. Um, but aside from that, uh, I, I generally feel like they haven't expressed um, they haven't expressed too much of a concern. Um, I mean, they're obviously concerned, but I, I think they are seeing Omicron um, kind of getting us to where we want to go, where we see a more widely transmissible um, disease, but a disease that has must uh, or vi a virus, excuse me, probably a, a virus, but a virus that has much less impact. And again, if you what they've told us, what's interesting about the two, the 250 is they've said that still only about, from the whole rise up, it's been about 20% that have been in the critical, either going to ICU or on event. They said at no time in the other run-ups was the percentage of people in the hospital that small. Now, do they, they don't like having people in the hospital for just this virus, uh, but they, they understand it better how to work and they're putting, it's putting much less pressure, even, even 200 people is putting much less pressure on their ICU capacity, which is, which is what they're most concerned with. Um, so I would say, it, it, that's why numbers are always hard to throw out because there's so many different issues with a, with a number. Um, if we're at 250 and 70% of them are going to ICU, we're, we're underwater. Um, but when you're kind of the other way, it's not, it's not as impactful. We do have a call today at two o'clock and I'll know more at that particular time where they are with, uh, but I mean, I, I think they are continuing to work through it. I, I think they did think by this pat last week, we would start seeing a downturn. Um, so that was a little surprising, but basically, as I told you, we, we've kind of, we've kind of gone up and down in a flat mode for about a week. Um, which that also tells me every other time we've done that with, with any other variant that we've eventually turned and gone down. Um, so, um, you know, I think we're still watching and um, we're, we're cautiously watching and we'll continue to do that. Jim. Going back to the homeless issue, you said uh, the city's working with partners place 75 people. What's the time frame on that? Is that in the last month or is that in the last year? That's within the last year. That's within the last year. And then, um, because we had we had roughly 64 um, that we had uh, we we had done 64 and they were referenced in that meeting back in back in September or, uh, September uh, we've placed I think about 11 or so uh, Lawrence I'm looking in the back we've been able to place some of those people into other other shelter at this particular time so we've been able to find opportunities to move uh, to move and that's why we've gone up to 75. Um, you also when you were talking earlier you kind of made the point that it's kind of ridiculous how we found ourselves in that position this position what do you what do you mean by that i think it's ridiculous that we're not all collaboratively working together that's what i meant um i mean uh, it, it's it's this is a problem that is a serious problem that should have everybody working together. And I can tell you, in any problem we've done as a, as a city, I don't ever expect to get 100% of the way all the time. I tell people who come and work with me, I'm like, listen, I can't give you 100% of what you want. But if we work good and look for ways we can work together, I can probably get you 70, 75% of what you want. Um, I think that's what collaboration looks like. Um, I think there are some individuals who, who simply have to have 100% and it just, it, it, it's what creates friction and this, this constant, um, if we were all working together and pulling in the same direction, I think we'd get there a whole lot faster. And you don't have to interview me about that. You can, you can go talk to the other people who are, who are out there working and solving homelessness and they'll tell you, you know, 
teamwork is the way to get this done. If you don't believe that, look at how much we've accomplished in the last year um, and look at what we've been able to do when we work together. Um, you know, for that matter, the most interesting thing that came out of, uh, one of the things that also, it's not just sometimes we live here, we get caught up. We, we tend to see things how they always are and we don't, we don't take into stock sometimes what's going on. The, the most interesting thing that when Marbuck came down here, I know he's, he's a little controversial between everybody and what's going on, but the most interesting thing, comment that he made when he came back here in April of 21 was, was when he came here, whatever, in 15 with the prior administration, he indicated that none of, and he said, he used the word very explicitly, none of our, uh, our agencies that were working with homelessness were working together. It was all, it was all a cross patch. When he came back in April, he said, he goes, I can't believe how many people you have working together. Now, he was the first one to acknowledge, yeah, you don't have everybody working together. And we said, we know we don't have everybody working together. But he was amazed at how many people we did have working together. Um, and, and, you know, I, I think an assessment, just somebody else who understands the issue and the problem looking at us and said, golly, if you have that many people working together, you're going to eventually find solutions. I think we have found solutions. I think we are finding ways to, to work and do it. Um, I, I, think, I think we can provide a model um, for other cities and to be working within here, and we can begin to find real solutions for homelessness. Uh, but it's only going to happen by everybody working together. It's only going to happen by everybody says, hey, we got to have some patience. Was it, is it everything I want to do? No, I didn't want to last a year for us to find solutions to figure out how to do it. But did it take a year? Yeah, it, it, sometimes it, it, it works through. Um, you know, a, a lot of these processes that we have been the only ones I know of that have taken these on, uh, and again, it's, you know, they are challenges and it is difficult, but when you come to the end of it, you have a much better community and you have a much better community that people want to be a part of. And I would tell you right now, if you look at anything that's going on in the city of Pensacola, I don't care even with the challenges we're having with prices, we continue to have more and more people want to come be a part of this community. And I think it speaks to the whole fact of what we're doing. And I told you this back in May of 2020, I said, listen, if we get out of COVID, we are going to explode as a community because I'm seeing this and I'm seeing a lot of things we've got coming together and what we're doing and what we're working. Um, so I certainly hope we will continue to do that and we will find uh, solutions to the things that challenge us. Uh, these are big challenges. These are not small things. And so they will take time. They will take working together and, and they will take some give and take. And um, again, um, I think it's unfortunate. Some people, some people do want to have 100%. And, you know, it just it makes it challenging. But uh, for the most part, we got a lot of good private citizens that are working together to solve it. Now, your, 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 your own paper so wrote an editorial talked about how we should let the people who are working it solve it. We don't need politicians involved in this. We don't. Um, I mean, we, we, need, we have good people doing it. All we need to do in a political system is give them an opportunity to work together to find solutions. And they will find solutions. And that's what we've done. Yes. Mayor, uh, when will the next workshop on the uh, discussion about privatization of electric mm. utility, has that been scheduled? I think it's scheduled for Wednesday. This, this week? Yeah, that, that's a council initiative. Um, you know, I mean, my issue, I'm going to write to them. I'm going to tell them, you know, the issue when you, when you get involved in this, you get, you got to figure out a goal. Um, it really is dependent on goals. Um, and, and until everybody aligns and goals that they can agree on, it's very challenging because everybody will have a certain way they want to look at it. But um, I think first and foremost, it's going to be cost and price. Um, and, and what we've seen with housing, a variety of things, we can't absorb more cost for energy. Cost for energy themselves has been going up. Um, I think behind that, there are two other things that are important. I think cost is probably the most overriding uh, that the council is going to have to figure out because I'm not going to support anything that doesn't um, 
doesn't at least keep us neutral uh, from a cost standpoint. If it adds any cost, I'm, no, we're not. We're not even. That's, that's going to be a no go. So, um, I mean, this is kind of a, an interesting position. I'm, I'm happy that the council has chosen to take an initiative and, and let them go I, and, and let me sit in the judge's chair, and I'm, I'm happy to judge. Um, but no, if it, if it doesn't, if it doesn't solve cost, if it doesn't th make things less costly for our citizens, no, I'm not going to do it. And I haven't seen many models. Um, that even become cost neutral. So uh, it's, that's going to be a very tough, but you know, I'm willing to see what the council brings forward. If they can bring something forward uh, that actually brings costs down for people, um, that's a good thing. But I, I, I'm, I'm skeptical. But cost is number one. Behind that, there are two backdrops that I think that are important. One is, I think, what we already see happening with, you know, uh, a change in how we get our energy. Um, you know, I know people aren't happy in some ways with everything uh, in industrial power, but if you look at what FPNL has done here, they've moved out of coal. We no longer have coal here in Northwest Florida. We have natural gas. And then they've put a significant amount of investment in solar. I think certainly renewables are a big part of what we want to see uh, going forward. Um, so I think if, if it's just cost and it's sending us back to coal, no, I'm, I'm not really interested in that. So, you know, I mean, uh, but let's see what they what they come back with. Um, so I think in some way or another, it's got to be something that's that's not sending us backwards in what we've what we've already made accomplishments and beginning to see happen uh, with how power is generated in renewables. And then third is is power reliability. Um, I mean, uh, you know, again, I, I want to know how many people. We, we've got to hire um, to uh, take care of lines if this is the case, um, where we're going to get these people in a shortage and how much we have to pay them. Um, again, these things all come back to come back to cost, but I think I think reliability is something citizens are, are, are going to want to have, and it's it's something that I continue to get reminded of, um, uh, you know, by people who've lived places where the municipality has been in charge of the power lines and, and, and challenges that have happened with reliability. Um, so I don't want to I don't want to give on those things reliability or renewables um, to, to make price uh, better. Uh, but you know that those are things if they if they can find a better system that provides us better better price and doesn't um, cost the citizens in those other ways, then uh, I'm open to it. But I'm I'm I'll look forward to what they come up with. Mayor, what would you say to people that would say that uh, Pensacola Energy is a great model for municipal-run utilities, and this should be the same? Uh, Pensacola Energy crosses different government boundaries; it maintains lines, and it provides a low-cost uh, energy alternative to the private sector. I agree with that in a lot of ways, but unfortunately, the way our franchise works, it's not going to allow us to spend without the counties. Um, Without the county's buy-in, uh, we're stuck just being where we are in our own jurisdiction. Um, while I think Pensacola Energy is a good way to do that with the gas and what's there, that model is not what what we're being asked to look at. We only have we only have the rights to to uh, to 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 the city of Pensacola is what we we would have the rights. We wouldn't have the rights to all of Gulf Power. So um, in the county, unless the county decided to move that direction, uh, the way. The gas company started, and, and what happened was it started, and it, it moved forward, and, and it moved out before there were issues. And Scamby County basically gave us the uh, the the right of way, which we have right now, um, except for what's in Century, and then in Gulf Breeze. Uh, I mean, on Pensacola Beach, Gulf Breeze has. So, aside from that, we have we have we already have it from the county. We have an agreement we signed. They recently re-upped that agreement for us. So. You know we're we're very proud of what we're able to do there, but that's not what we're looking at. So I don't want to I don't want to I want to make sure we're looking apples to apples, John. Um, uh, but I do think Pensacola Energy can serve as a good model and, and has worked um, and, and does work very well. Um, I, I'm I mean it it has been good and they are good for cities to generate additional revenue. That's good. But at the same time, I don't want to generate additional revenue, even if it's generated for the city, by taking it off the backs of our citizens. I mean, that's just another way to, you know, put in a tax. So, my issue is if we can do something that doesn't cost the citizens any more, um, it allows us to deal with the same amount of renewables, 
and this and and also makes it so that we don't sacrifice reliability. Um, I'm I'm game to look at it, but uh, but again, it's going to be a tall order to figure that out because. Uh, again, we just have a lot of things that we have to do. We don't have the franchise. It's not like it's not like the gas. We don't have the franchise except for the jurisdictional boundaries of the city. This is my last question on this, but I guess for just the public's expectation, when the deadline for the homeless uh, camp runs out, what are we going to see? Are we going to see police move in and, and start arresting people? <laughs> I, I think. I think. I think we're going to have people talking with other people and explaining to them what the what the matter is and what's going on and why they need to go and, and you know th that will be it and I think I think with people who we can work with and we can help relocate we'll it, I mean you can talk and you can find good ways to do stuff and move people forward and, and actually improve their their place I think people who are worried about the general things they need to be worried about uh, in their own personal life will find ways because we'll have other solutions for them and a place to go. Now, I can say that, that if there are people that politics is their bent, Jim, and that's their position, I, I, can't, I can't control that. We'll have to deal with that as, as, as best we can. Uh, but it's our intent to, at that point, close the park. There'll be, there'll be people coming in the next day uh, beginning to set up and, and deal with the construction of what we need to do uh, to clean the place up. So we've already got them lined up to to come on February 1st. Uh, so we, we, we will have that. But, I mean, listen, wherever there are people, we're going to go get there. We're going to find them. We're going to work with them. We're going to say, hey, we got an opportunity for you to, to move and, and to go. And if the issue is they're really intent and, and they're dealing with their own personal or, or whatever they want to uh, go with, we'll find a way to, to, to work with them and, and move them to a location that fits for them. If they're not and they're there for political reasons, then we'll have to, we'll have to deal with that. I mean, I mean, but it is, you know, I'm, I'm confident we'll be able to find a solution. We'll be able to find the right place for them to get to as well. So, you know, th those are, that, that will be a part of it. But uh, I can't, I can't, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll have to wait till next week and we'll, we'll figure out what we can do. But I mean, we will be on the first. Um, we will be beginning that process of of, uh, of setting up an area where we can we can secure people's property uh, and put it together and and do what we need to do. For the most part, at least, though, I hear we're working with many of the people have made choices, um, made selections of what they want to go to, and we are working to get them in a place of, of temporary transition for 30 to 45 days, and then obviously we expect. The permanent um, locations to be open at that point. Thank you.